you know, lighting those candles for the sake of pretty YouTube when it's almost 90 degrees inside is probably the most ridiculous thing I've done in a while. <laughs> but anyways, hello and welcome. I'm Maria from So Through Time, and this time we're making an Edwardian 1901 fancy shirtwaist. Lately, I've been reading a lot of turn-of-the-century fashion magazines, mostly delineators and home journals. They can both be find, uh, found for free online, and I'll link them down below. But anyways, in those magazines, one thing that keeps on coming up over and over again is wardrobe planning, and specifically a very, like, compact, what we would nowadays call a capsule wardrobe. These were very essential because in this era, this is already a time period when it is considered proper and important for all women, regardless of your social status, to dress in a reasonably fashionable way and in a smart way. So if you are a lady of limited means, as those magazines call it, or you're maybe traveling because they talk over and over again about how there's so many luggage restrictions in modern times, kind of like today with airplanes, that you can't take as many pieces of luggage as you'd like. That there was, especially trains, had very limited space for luggage. So you had to prepare your wardrobe accordingly. And so these magazines give you different ideas on how to create a capsule wardrobe for these occasions. Now there are many different ways of achieving this sort of compact capsule wardrobe, and I'll get more into details in future videos when I start making these other pieces. But the most important item that I keep on finding in these is the dressy shirtwaist. It is not only an, an essential item for these kind of capsule wardrobes, but basically any women's wardrobe in the era. Now, throughout the Victorian era, a basque or a bodice has been the woman's basic upper body garment. It could come either in day bodices or evening bodices, but it was always this tight-fitting bodice that changed with fashion, the sh shapes of the sleeves changed with fashion, but it was basically the same type of garment. It was built the same way. When in the 1860s first start appearing shirtwaists that are basically blouses, like the one I'm wearing now. Of course, this is 1930s, not 1860s, but anyways, the basic idea that it's a looser fitting gar a fitted garment that doesn't necessarily have the same structure in the bodice part, but it could have very tailored collar details and that sort of stuff, like in a blouse or men's shirt. In the Victorian era though, these shirt waists were considered a casual daytime or work outfit. They would not be appropriate for any other type of wear really. But by the early 1900s, shirt waists had basically taken over and almost completely obliterated the bodice for daytime and even afternoon wear, so that it was considered appropriate not only for casual and work wear, but also for more dressy occasions, even parties or casual dinners. The more casual morning, daytime, or workwear shirt, uh, shirt waist, would be usually made out of cotton, linen, or some sort of printed wash silk. Or in the winter time, they could be a flannel or alpaca. They tended to be made with more minimal embellishments. They could have pleated details, maybe ruffles, and it, sometimes even a little bit of lace. But it was more limited. It was a more tailored, more menswear inspired garment. And it would always either have a high collar or it would have a separate collar, a detachable collar, like in menswear shirts at the time. Now I want to note that this did change in about 19, in 1905. That's when you start seeing shirts that come high still for daytime or dressy wear, 
but they don't necessarily have a high collar anymore. Now these casual daytime shirtwaists would be worn by all social classes. The biggest difference between what the shop girl would wear versus the upper class socialite would be basically the materials and the embellishments and their quality and price, like for instance, buttons. But not only that, those were kind of minute differences. The biggest difference would be the other garments worn with the shirt waist and the accessories, especially jewelry. Now, whereas the shop girl could wear most of her day that one casual shirt waist that she would wear for work and only change when she went to dinner, most women who were either middle class or upper class would change their outfits several times during the day and they would only wear these casual shirt waists during the morning hours and they would change into a different outfit altogether for afternoon promenading or visiting and there was different gowns for different occasions not to mention all the different evening gowns for different levels of evening wear but that's also where the dressy shirt waist comes in because it is that one item that can go all the way from that afternoon wear, sort of casual visiting friends or just going for a walk to church to basically any function that is in dressiness level between that casual morning outfit and a full on evening gown. And that's why these shirt, dressy shirt waists were loved so much, not only because they were convenient for the woman of limited means or a traveling woman or somebody else who needed very a very compact wardrobe because it could fill a very big gap in what you could wear during the day, but also because it was a very easy and casual item. You didn't necessarily have to have a full ensemble for afternoon walking or visiting and then for a casual dinner and then for a party because you could wear this one garment with an odd skirt or a separate skirt as we would nowadays call it. Now these dressy shirt waists were often made of silks but they could also be made out of fine wools or fine cottons or different blends of the, of the fibers and they would often be very embellished. They you would usually have still the high neck, but it was often of a see-through or flowy kind of light material like lace or organza or something like this that it would give a more showy kind of vibe. Like you're not so fully dressed, if you get what I mean. I don't know how to explain that better. <laughs> but it would show a little skin or it could just be a lighter material, richer material that would show that it is not as severe of a style, not so much menswear type of style. And again, to make them less severe, they would often have lace or ribbon or embroidery or appliques on them and different kinds of decorations, more oomph to them than the casual Dress, uh, non dressy shirt waist. In 1900 and 1901, even to 1902 and 3, usually dressy shirt waist would still have long sleeves though. It would be considered an evening shirt waist if it would have short sleeves. But after that, around 04, 05, that does chart, start to change and you'd start seeing also shorter sleeves. They aren't usually like short, short, but they can be elbow length, either slightly above or slightly under. And that becomes a more common feature then. But before that, it doesn't really happen. In 03, you do start to actually see if this, if the shorter elbow length sleeves in afternoon ensembles, but they are usually full outfits, not a separate dressy shirt waist. So the actual patterning of the shirt waist doesn't necessarily determine whether it's a dressy shirt waist or a more casual shirt waist. It can be completely up to the materials and the embellishment put on top of the shirt waist to make it 
go from that casual morning shirt waist to a dressy afternoon shirt waist. Now the pattern I'm using for this shirt waist comes from The Voice of Fashion by Frances Grimble. And the way these patterns in this book works is that you get, there's a, a set of rulers in the appendix and you basically take two of the ruler pieces, I just scanned them and then printed them out. And then I just glued them together, the two pieces to make it the right length. And then you use that to use uh, to get the coordinates in the pattern piece and make, draw up the pattern. I have found these patterns really easy to use and they work usually perfectly on my body without me having to actually change anything. But I am quite busty and also I'm very short waisted. So that is something you might want to keep in mind if you're neither. Of course, the look of the era is busty, so even if you aren't busty naturally, most likely you will want to build that silhouette anyway, so that won't necessarily be as much of an issue as the being short-waisted. So you will want to mock up those patterns. I didn't because, well, I haven't had any problems with any of the previous ones, and luckily I didn't have any problems with this one either. To draft the shirt waist, I take the appropriate ruler from the back of the book in my bust size and start with a straight line on the edge of the paper. Then I draw dots according to the coordinates given on the pattern drawing. Then I connect the dots to form the pattern. The main body is a low slub silk dupioni. The front is a very flowy vintage silk. The high collar and the small yoke piece are a satin stripe organza. The front edge of the main body is cut on the selvage, so all I need to do is fold the front according to the pattern. The embroidery I'm doing next will hold the pleats in place. Plates are secured with a herringbone stitch. And the front edge is embroidered in a variation of the feather stitch. I found from a period embroidery manual on the antique pattern library. I'll link it down below. Like this design, a lot of these shirt waist embroidery patterns are fairly simple to do. It doesn't need to be anything super intricate to give that fancy look of embroidery. The front bodice piece made out of the lighter silk is roll whipped gathered to match the yoke piece. are covered in cotton tape to keep them from fraying. Because the front piece is such a flowy silk, I laid them down on the ground and pinned them on flat to make, it, make sure that the edges are even. right side of the shirt waist front gets sewn together. Then the collar is basted onto the yoke. And so does the back piece to the front pieces at the shoulder. After trying it on and making sure everything fits, I stitch on the rolled whip gather to the yoke and backstitch the shoulder seams. 
this could have easily been done by machine instead, but I was feeling too lazy to actually bother walking upstairs to sew it by machine since it's such a short seam anyways. And then the raw edges are covered with bias binding. Then I sew a basting thread onto the left front edge to mark where the fabrics will align once the snap closures are in place. Then I French seam the side seams. Then I baste and sew on the sleeves by hand. I find that ungathered snug sleeves like these are much easier to set in perfectly smoothly by hand, as the machine, even with my dual feed, tends to make it easing the fabrics together more tricky. And again, the raw edges are covered in bias binding. Then I sew a cotton tape with snaps on it onto the left front of the bodice making sure on the left side piece that it doesn't actually show on the front. Then I gather the bottom edge of the sleeve to fit the cuff. Then sew on the cuffs. Then I bind the bottom edge of the shirtwaist with self-fabric. <music> Lastly, I added snaps to the collar and cuffs, and here is the finished shirtwaist. This really narrow silhouette of 1901 means that I really should have ironed better that shoulder line and that's why it's puckering a bit there. But all in all, I'm really pleased with how this came out and I can't wait to finish up more pieces so that I can finish my capsule wardrobe from 1901. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, please hit that like button because it really does help us out. And if you haven't already, please subscribe so that I can see you again next time. Bye!